Hey, morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to see you. I've been off for a couple weeks. One of them was because I had COVID, so that happened. Uh, it's the first time I had it. I thought I was superhuman and was like, you know, the one person that wouldn't get it. Um, so thanks very much, Beth, for filling in, and, and thanks, Dick, for speaking last week. I mean, I feel really grateful to be a part of such an interesting, thoughtful, um, talented community. So, um, yeah, and, it, and it's good to be back. It's good to see all of you, and uh, yeah, welcome to C3. I, I want to read actually something from um, the very bottom here of the front page here, just about C3. As, as most of you know, at least some of you, that uh, a few months ago we participated, Beth helped lead us in this process called Just Cause, which is just a way of clarifying what is it that we're about, and what, what are we aiming at, and could we say, could we come up with a succinct statement that would tell us about our own values just in a fresh way? And, and could the statement be true this year and also 50 years from now? Something like that. So I just want to read you the statement. C3 inspires spiritual, intellectual, and creative exploration and action led by the questions, what are the biggest challenges we face on our shared journey? And how do we, how do we respond to those challenges. I, I, I already believe and trust that C3 is this kind of place. And, and you're a part, of the, uh, a part of C3 and part of what makes this happen, this kind of um, a place where our, our own spiritual and intellectual and creative exploration takes place and that we're not afraid of uh, some of the biggest questions and challenges we think we face as, as, a human be- as human beings and as a culture um, not that we're like here to solve them, like, <laughs> um, but we're here to wrestle with them, and that's part of what keeps, I think, uh, a kind of vitality present in this place. And I'm, I, wanna, I wanted to start by reading that just to remind us, what, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? And also because at Talk Back, I want to talk about this statement. I want to just spend our time just with a little... Uh, a little bit of creative exploration about what do we think this means and, and really more importantly, what do you think the biggest challenge is? Um, what are the biggest challenges we face just in your own life and also as a community and then some of the more global questions? Um, okay, so I wanted to start there. And how is that related to um, our topic at hand, well, we've, we've been in a series, as you know, called The Great Questions. So that's obviously the sort of thing that we like to wrestle with. And today, I wanted to talk about, I don't want to talk about, and I do want to talk about the question of truth. It came up almost right away when I started soliciting, like, what do you think some of the great questions are? People are like, well, what is the truth? And the answer is easy. You just watch, watch the news. <clears throat> I didn't want to wrestle with it, and I did. It's a, it's a challenging um, it's a challenging question, and I wanted to do it sort of f- at least how I'm wrestling with with it, which is um, mythos or logos, mythos or logos. I want to talk about what what we what I mean by these things, and um, maybe not that you need to buy my definition, but it was coming up in in pre talk. If we're going to ask the question, what is truth, we want to at least wrestle with a, a, a definition. And maybe for the time being, I might just say, whatever's real, <laughs> whatever's real in the ultimate sense, that must be the same thing as what's true. And, and probably what's more important is a commitment and an orientation toward pursuing such a thing. I'd like to pursue what's real, what's ultimately the case. I don't want to be pursuing things that are not ultimately the case or not ultimately real or something that's false or something that's an illusion. I'd like to be after going toward um, what's ultimately real. Is that, is that a fair enough starting place? And right away, I, want, I begin to wonder, well, how have people always wrestled with this? And I'd like to suggest the primary modes has been through mythos, where we get words like myth, and logos, where we get words like logic. And it is true that both mythos and logos are Greek words, so we could say the place I'm coming from has sort of a Greek backdrop. That's true, but I think it's larger than that. In fact, funny, interesting, you know, fun fact, fun party fact. I'm sure you're going to love this. 
is that the word mythos isn't Greek. We don't know what the origin is. It's just pre-Greek. <laughs> that's, what, that's, what, that's what linguists, when they have no idea, they just say it's pre-whatever it was, you know, so... It's pre-Greek, mean, meaning it came into consciousness, it came into language even before um, Greek was a language. So it's much older. Um, okay, let's start with some Joseph Campbell, because my very first introduction to mythology, besides, besides college, I, I, I should mention that, I did take a mythology class in college. I was an English major, so I had to take it. And I didn't, wasn't going to class a lot or ever, now that I think about it. This is right at the beginning, beginning of college. And um, I went to a Christian school for my youngest years, and then I went to a public school later on. And somehow I just missed mythology altogether. I don't know how. I mean, I'd heard of Zeus. And I came in one day, and my uh, future wife didn't know it's my future wife, and my future wife, I turned to her and said, what are they passing out? She said, it's the test. And I was like, okay, well... <laughs> <laughs> That's not, not the best day to decide to go to class. And I, and I completely failed the mythology test, which is funny to me because now I'm so into it. Um, but it took me a while. It took me a long. I didn't really discover mythology until I discovered Joseph Campbell, and starting with his little interviews with Bill Moyers and, and then his books and things like this. So I want to read two quotes from Joseph Campbell. I want to read them in reverse order than the way they're on the page here. So we'll start with the middle one. Half the people in the world think that the metaphors of their half the people in the world think that the metaphors of their religious traditions, for example, are facts. Right? Half the people in the world. And the other half contends that they are not facts at all. As a result, we have people who consider themselves believers because they accept metaphors as facts, and we have others who classify themselves as atheists because they think religious metaphors are lies. <laughs> which is kind of a funny way of sort of exaggerating a sort of division here. But I think he is saying something that's true. We do tend to, to, to treat myth and um, metaphors very differently, depending on where you're coming from. And that's largely a product of the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment, which I'm not going to go into tremendous detail right now, but the way we treat Religious metaphor certainly is a result of the, of the Enlightenment. Okay, let's read the second one here. Mythology is not a lie. Mythology is poetry. It's metaphorical. It has been well said that mythology is the penultimate truth. Penultimate because the ultimate cannot be put into words. It is beyond words, beyond images, beyond that bounding rim of the Buddhist wheel of becoming. Mythology pitches the mind beyond that rim to what can be known but not told. Which is already the beginning of a definition of mythos. It's beyond what can be told, and, and, and it comes to us in images that are incomplete and in poetry. And we, some part of the human spirit craves poetry, craves contact with what we don't yet know, with the unknown, with the, with the great unknowables that we must live with and be with. And the poetry helps us stay in relationship with it. Now, in the Greek world, well, actually, let me, let me start in a slightly different place instead of riffing on the quote. Let, let me ask you a question. Why doesn't information tend to change people? I mean, it, it's not always the case. Sometimes you get new information and, and you change. Like, but sometimes not. You know, I can have the check engine light on my car on for just years. <laughs> and I'm not going to do anything about it. <laughs> it's just there. So why does an information tend to change people? Like, for example, let's take the environmental information that we, we're being inundated with. And, and let's just say that, that overwhelmingly, it seems to suggest that human pollution changes the planet. Right? We don't even have to call it climate change or all these other debates. Pollution changes things, not for the better. And I think most people would agree with that, regardless of political position or, or you know, social status. And yeah, pollution, uh, and, but then we don't do anything. We're like, yeah, that's true. It's kind of like the check engine light. Yep, I guess it's on, but um, we'll just keep driving. Or what about 
all of the information, which is really non-negotiable now, around um, processed food, refined sugar, that it's making us sick. We, we, have, we know this. Nobody's like, oh, it's making us healthy and strong. Just look at our finest athletes around the world. They're just consuming refined sugar and laying around, you know? No. We, we, and actually, I, this is pretty dark, but the most recent statistics are 73% of Americans are overweight. That's a lot. That's a lot. And it's not because we don't know the information. We know the information. We even, we even are aware of the corruption. We're aware that places like Coca-Cola, I'm not going to name names like Coca-Cola and Pepsi and places like that, lobby the Food and Drug Administration to make the purchase of their beverages part of a healthy diet that gets put in schools and in your pyramid chart and all that. I mean, we know that. And we're like, yep, it's sort of like the check engine light. Just keep driving until the thing breaks. All right. So why does an information change people? Which I just want you to, to sit on that as we start to explore the difference between mythos and logos. So, um, okay, now a little bit more on the Greek stuff. Now, the Greeks imagine, this is imagination world. This is the world of the unconscious. And they imagine truth as a river, which is interesting because it's a way of saying it flows anyway, and I like that because if it's just flowing, it's not really my capacity to control it or even understand it is very limited. It's just moving. Truth is moving. Reality is just moving somewhere down there. And every once in a while, we come into contact with the underground river, which was the same thing as the underground river of memory, by the way. So truth and memory are related in Greek. Um, I, I've said that before here, but anyway, so here... Here it is, the underground river is flowing. And what the Greeks imagined is that there were two ways, two modes that might put us in relationship with the underground river, two modes of being, two ways of being, two modes of thought, you could even say, and those two modes were mythos and logos. Mythos puts us in contact with the underground river, and logos puts us in contact with the underground river, both of them. And they were both necessary, and if you stop the average Greek and ask them, how do you pursue truth? They would say, mythos and logos. They teach us what's true in the world, but they're, they're operating on these kind of parallel tracks. And they're also in conversation with one another, and they're, I, I, as you'll see as we kind of unpack these things. Okay, so what do I mean by mythos? And I'm going to, I'll read to you some, I'll try to define it here. So first of all, um, the word mythos means speech or story, or tale. So it is connected to words, or conversation. But the orientation has more to do with like a story, a tale, which is a certain way of speaking. That's different than the Logos way of speaking, as you'll see in a moment, but it has to do with speech. And it's interested in what's timeless and what's eternal. It's often concerned about the origins of life. That's why all, all um, ancient cultures that we know of had origin myths. It's just because that's the orientation of mythology. It's, it's trying to say, what, how did we come to be? Or how did anything come to be? Which is another way of saying, what is real? What's true? So it's interested in the origins of things. Or the original patterns of things. Even the original patterns of the human heart. Before there was psychology, there was mythos. And, and any contemporary psychologist will claim that mythology was the first expression of it. And Freud would say the same thing, you know. Um, most of Freud's major points were taken from mythology as a way of explaining them, like the eatable complex. That's a myth. Like, you're a narcissist, you say to your friend. <laughs> <laughs> that comes from Freud, but it comes from the narcissist myth. So they're in conversation. We're dealing with matters of the human heart here, which you want to ask, what's true? What's ultimately the case? Um, another way of putting origin stories, I just want to bring a little nuance, is the reason why people told them and enacted them is because it, they weren't just interested in describing what happened, but what is happening. It, it's as if, what, how is the world coming into being as we're being? So it kind of had this dual aspect. It's what happened and is what's happening, something like that. Its number one concern is with meaning, 
not just with facts, but meaning. Facts are one thing. Refined sugar's not that good for you. Yeah, but pff, it's not as meaningful as the cookie I'm going to eat, you know? You know what I'm saying. They're, they're not um, opposites, but there's a kind of tension between them. Um, all right, what else can we say about it? Um, well, I already mentioned some things about it being sort of the origins of psychology. Psyche is, a, is another Greek myth <laughs> um, before modern science or, or modern psychology. Out of the depths of our own being come powers and energies that govern us when we least expect it. That's, that's much more of the underworld. That's the unconscious. So mythos would be more interested in the unconscious. And I should say this, that myths were ritualized. Sometimes we get the wrong impression that, like, they were read. Remember, very few people in the ancient world could read in the first place, and even fewer people had copies of whatever written material it was. It's not like, you know, during Bible times, you know, Jesus is walking around with a book, you know, like, hey, let me refer to myself here in the Gospel of Matthew, okay? They didn't have them. So they were, they were in the hands of the elite, so the stories were told, but more importantly, they were ritualized. They were told in rituals. They were enacted. And um, I don't know when, the, when was the last time you went to like a football game or some other sports game. It, what At the beginning of the game, there's always some kind of ritualized enactment. It's not like people show up and just be like, okay, I'm here at a game, and they sit down. There's this whole ritual. People are chanting and shouting and waving flags, and a band is marching around, and people are wearing weird hats, and there's fireworks now. And what is all that stuff? It's a ritualized expression of something, and it's effective, and it communicates something deep, largely, my team's better than your team, but it, it operates on that level. Well, that's how all the ancient myths were told as well, too. They were ritualized. You did them every year. You enacted them. And that's what, partly what made them so long-lasting, and when, finally, when somebody did write them down, they remembered what to write down because they had been enacting them. And by the way, Karen Armstrong, who I'm going to read from in a few minutes, she's got a new book called Sacred Nature that David Dean gave to me, up, and the opening chapter is actually, um, surprisingly and amazingly, is a conversation between mythos and, and logos. Anyway, what was I going to say about her? Um, oh, she says, it's a matter of scholarly debate, which came first, the ritual or the, or the story? And that's, that's pretty intriguing. So probably it was the ritual came first, and then later the story was built around it. Maybe it's a chicken and an egg thing. Okay, um, so people have literally enacted them out. And but that was, you know, a kind of a crass example, the football stadium. But I don't know if you've ever been to a synagogue when, during Purim. Purim is, one of, uh, is a Jewish festival. Anyone know what Pur Purim is? Okay, it's, it's this amazing... So I've been to Purim ceremonies. And first of all, you dress up like Halloween. And in the synagogue, they read the entire book of Esther. You're like, who would read an entire book? Well... They do in the synagogue. They read the entire thing, and every time Haman, who's the enemy's um, name, is read, then people are like, bah! and they like scream, and they shout, and they beat drums, and sometimes a rabbi will have this giant drum, and he'll be beating it. And what's happening is they're ritualizing the story, and it's, and it's going deep. And it's bringing out all of the deep dimensions of what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be Jewish? What do these stories really communicate? It's not a scholarly... You know, well, it says in the book of Esther this, and what you need to understand is the word means this in Hebrew. No, you're literally beating a drum, and you have a scary mask on, and children are, like, running around eating candy, and people are drinking too much. So all this happens in the synagogue. Okay. That's mythos. That's the world of mythos. So what is logos? Logos is reason. It's the ordering principle. It also means word, like... In the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John cleverly is playing with Logos and the Genesis story and says, in the beginning was the Word. Well, primarily, I mean, people would say that in the beginning was the Word, and now they would say John meant Jesus, but he's being much more subtle than that and sophisticated. He's saying in the beginning was order and reason, and that had something to do with God, and it was the spoken, ordering nature, and it brought order out of chaos, and that's the primary point of Logos. The world is chaotic. Would you agree? Do we have any capacities to order the world? And the answer was yes. Our Logos, our rational capacities, our ordering 
capacities, to gather is really what the word means, to gather, and we gather with our speech and our reason, and it's very important and it's an essential way of pursuing the truth. Have I made sense? Otherwise, things are just too chaotic. Now, of course, Logos is concerned with the facts, object, the objective world, the conscious world, not the unconscious world, you could say. Um, by the way, interestingly enough, one of the early Greek philosophers, Empendosceles, not, not very well known, um, is considered to be the father of Logos, but he says he discovered it in kind of what we would call a psychedelic visionary trip, but it was given to him by the gods, he said. Logos, and he brought it back out, and he began to teach people about logic. So um, it's very pragmatic and rational. It's part of what we use to deal with the chaos of nature, as I already said. Um, and in a way, it's more future-oriented, like rather than mythos, which does tend to say what has always been the case, what's timelessly been the case. Logos would be like, well, what might, might be the case prag practically and pragmatically in the future? And what if we shaped the world this way? Or what if we took this piece of wood and formed it in a certain way as a kind of technology? Might that change our culture? You know, that kind of thing. You need Logos um, if you're going to make something happen. Now, right now, Logos, the rational, which gives birth to what we would even think about the scientific enlightenment and scientific rules and things like that, um, we would say that our world in general is much more ruled by logos than mythos most of the time. And that's primarily, you know, that, that has good and bad consequences, which I won't get into, but it's because of the Enlightenment. It's also because we live in a highly, right now especially, a highly technologically advanced culture, much more interested in how can we shape the world and use logic and reason to create the future we want. Have I made sense? but also tends to be quite cold. You know, science is actually, a, you know, from a, an emotional point, a kind of a cold pursuit because it's just interested in the facts. Um, okay. My point is, that I'd like to make today, it is that we need both. I mean, that's, you could probably guess that's my point in the first place, that, that somehow we need both. And if we're too one-sided, if we're too logos-centered, we miss something. Or mythology, an immature myth starts to rise up in the culture and dominate us because we're meaning-seeking creatures. And facts, a purely logos-oriented fact, doesn't tend to orient us around meaning because, like I said at the beginning, you know the facts and you don't change. So I think myth, in a sense, is being neglected this is partly why I'm always, you know, going on and on about them. Okay, think about the Prometheus story, for example. This is a good, this is a good tension. So Prometheus is the one who steals fire from the gods and gives it to human beings. All right, so what's this story about? Now, first of all, you, I want to encourage you to say, the story, to, I would encourage you not to say, the story's a lie because it's a myth. You know, Prometheus never existed, you know. You don't go to a movie, like name a, like the Avengers and be like, I can't take this seriously. This is, this is you know, this never existed. These, this is not realistic. You, you'll, you'll sit there and enjoy it. You'll be like, this is the weirdest and greatest thing I've ever seen, all right? Why? Because of this craving of meaning in mythology. So anyway, let's talk about Prometheus. Prometheus steals fire from the gods and gives it to human beings. So what's that story about? On one level, it's about logos. It's about the human capacity to harness fire and use it, which is a kind of technological development. It's such a massive technological development that they needed myths to try to wrestle with it. Think about human life without fire. You can't, actually. Like, a modern person cannot. Nothing about life would make sense. Nothing about your life would make sense without fire. So where did it come from? And how did human beings get the capacity to harness it and use it? And what are the consequences of it? And that's where the Prometheus story comes in and says, okay, well, human beings have fire. And so Pro Prometheus then gets cursed by Zeus because of this. It's a way of saying there are consequences to this. And the Promethean punishment is that He's tied to a rock, and every day the eagle of Zeus comes and eats out his liver, and the liver was the seat of the emotions. 
in the Greek world, okay? Not the heart, but the liver. Eat, him, hit, eat the liver out every single day, and then at night it would heal. Oh, finally, back, back to get. And then in the morning, dawn breaks, here comes the eagle to eat that thing out again. Now, why in the world were they telling that story and ritualizing that story by offering sacrifices to fire? Because if you don't treat it in a sacred way, you're going to burn the house down. Your technology is going to destroy you and the planet. So this story was a kind of emotional and symbolic warning about the dangers of technological advancement, if only Logos rules the day. Have I made sense? Okay, there's lots more of that, but just, you know, you can... Part, that, that's the second thing you can do at the party is bring up Prometheus. See how that goes for you. All right. Now, um, okay, well, let me say something personal, again, back to my discovery of Joseph Campbell and kind of an opening up around mythology. So I went to graduate school to study comparative religion and, and the Bible. So I have, I have a long and strange and arduous and uh, journey with the Bible, I guess. It's, it's the thing I love and the thing that I hate and then the thing that I hate and then the thing that I love and the thing that I resist and the thing that I come back to. It's like, it's very deep. And... Um, Graduate school was fun because it was like, okay, nobody's looking. Let's tear this thing apart, all right? It was fun in that sense. Let's look at it academically and critically. Let's use the powers of scholarship and linguistic studies, and it was fun, and you start to pull the thing apart. And it started to seem like a myth. Now, I'm using that in the most immature sense, like, well, none of this is true. We can't say this and this. It doesn't correspond to scientific facts and things like that. That's the, that was at least my starting place with biblical criticism. And then one day I was in class, and with, there was a guest lecturer, an Orthodox rabbi. He has a little kippah on. He has a little black coat on. And he was giving a lecture on Jonas, uh, on Jonah. Jonas is the Greek version of Jonah. Giving a lecture on Jonah. You know, the guy who got swallowed by the fish and all this kind of stuff. So, and it's an amazing lecture like unbelievable, and he's pulling out all these like poetic things and language things and cultural background things and, and you know, stuff that, is, uh, that I'd never heard before. It's all embedded in the story. And then when, uh, just about the time he's done with the lecture, he's like, ah, oh, you, know, you know, Jonah's such an interesting myth. And I'm like, wait, you know, what? And he just said it's an interesting myth. I thought we were just like wrestling with the deep truths of of the Jonah story, and now you're telling me that it's a myth? And it was interesting. It was the first time I ever met, really, a religious person that was thinking about myth differently, that was saying, Jonah really didn't get swallowed by a fish, and this story is profoundly true. And that really started, that, that, that really went in deep. Like, okay, I don't understand what the Bible is. That, that was my main feeling. I don't understand what a myth is. I don't understand what the truth is. How can something both not have happened and be true? It sort of launched me into a much different kind of questioning around these sorts of things. Um, okay. So a, a, a related point, and then I'll, I'll try to bring this thing to a close. As I've been trying to say, myth is interested in meaning. And we're, we're talking about this, and we easily came up with it in the pre-talk thing. But you can't guess the Bible. That's already one of them. But I'm going to ask you to, to guess what the third most popular book in the world is. All right, third most popular book. And it's a contemporary book. All right, it's the third most popular book in the world. It's third most read book in the world. It might be one of the most influential books ever certainly reached more people than anything else. Anyone have any guesses? It's, it's Harry Potter. Lord of the Rings is like fifth, by the way. Fifth. Uh, and I'll just name some other ones. Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, the Da Vinci Code. Okay? What are all these? They're myths. All right? So we can say we're all about logos. We're all about science. We're all about the facts. Our most popular book of all time is Harry Potter. All right? And I bet it's way more influential than most scientists, <laughs> all right? Reaching, and how can you get a kid, kids who don't read mostly, to read a 600-page book like nine times or whatever? I don't know how long the series is, okay? Well, how is that possible? 
Well, that craving is very deep. The mythological craving is very deep. And, the, and Harry Potter is true. It's just there is not a train station with whatever it is, seven and a half or nine and three quarters. You know, I, I, you can tell I didn't read it because I don't like myths. All right. So now I'm going to say something dark, which is if we don't wrestle deeply with myth, then we create them anyway. And they can dominate human culture and human imagination without much thought. The 20th century is an example of that with myths like communism, like what happened in Germany. That is a myth, a story that gets generated and popularized and goes in deep. So it's not just a light thing that we're talking about. So you need mythos, you need to wrestle with meaning, and we need logos. We need order, we need reason, we need logic. We need to be able to say, well, I'll get to some things in the end, so I'll pause there. Um, okay, I want to read to you a little bit of Karen Armstrong's book here. All right. Before the modern period... Both mythos and logos were regarded as essential. But by the 18th century, the people of Europe and America had achieved such astonishing success in science and technology that they began to discount myth as false and primitive. Society was no longer wholly dependent on a surplus of agricultural produce, like all previous civilizations, but relied increasingly on technological resources and the constant reinvestment of capital. In other words, a brand new world. This freed modern society from many of the constraints of traditional culture whose agrarian base had always been precarious. The long process of modernization took some three centuries and involved profound changes. Industrialization, the British agricultural revolution, the political reform of society, and an intellectual enlightenment that dis dismissed myth as futile and outmoded. Yet with our demythologized world, um, yet while our demythologized world may be comfortable for those of us fortunate enough to live in the first world in first world countries, it has not become the earthly paradise predicted by Francis Bacon and the other Enlightenment philosophers. Do you hear what she's saying here? We neglected something here along the way. We must disabuse ourselves of the fallacy that myth is untrue or represents an inferior mode of thought. We may be unable to return wholesale to pre-modern sensibility, I agree with her on this, but we can acquire a more nuanced understanding of the myths of our ancestors because they still have something to teach us, largely teach us about how to be related to the earth and to one another, that's what she says. So I think this is a very gentle way of, of, of I don't know, wrestling with the question of truth and 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 how we might continue to wrestle with mythos. Let me put it more simply. If it's only STEM in education, if it's only STEM, uh, we never learn what's sacred or to revere nature or to how, how to treat our fellow human beings. Um, and if we don't find new slash old myths to tell and to enact, a kind of cold rationalism will be just that. It'll be kind of cold and... Um, I think one of the, maybe I'll end by um, some, what I think some of the greatest challenges will be in the coming years if they're not already here, and that is uh, with artificial intelligence. It's already here. Artificial intel intelligence is already here. And, um, you know, there, there are those in Silicon Valley who are working on extending human life, and they think probably pretty shortly it'll be 300 years, all right, 300 years. And everyone's like, yeah, or... We're like, wait a minute. Um, a ask yourself a question. Most, most people, not you, of course, or anyone in this room, but most people w who you know, let's say they make it to 80, 90, something like that. What a gift. And, but do you think another 200-some years would be good? <laughs> most people, you know, no one in this room, would you want them to live 300 years? <laughs> See, right away, that, those are questions of mythos. That's questions of meaning. Like, because we can do it, should we? 
And I know those are moral and ethical questions, which is why we have to struggle even with the ancient... Do you know in the Bible it says it's funny... It says that God gets sick, I'm going to paraphrase, God gets sick of human beings living so long because they keep making a mess that he limits their years to 120, all right? Now, do I think that literally happened? Do I think people at one time lived 900 years? No, I do not think that. But the story is trying to say there's something profound about the limitations of death and the span of a human life. So I'm not against artificial intelligence wholesale. I'm not saying... You want that, this, this ship has already sailed. We are going there. I'm just saying, if we only, if we only follow blind logos and we're going to do it because we can do it, then we're going to re- really miss, miss something and we're going to create a much more dangerous environment. Have I made sense? Okay. All right, that's what I got for you today. Thanks for listening.